Uh, good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Crime Pays by Bonnie Dozen. Today we're coming to you from South Tasmania, Southern Tasmania, walking to a relic population of uh, Huon Pines, which uh, of course are not pines at all. They're from an ancient uh, family of conifers known as the Podocarpaceae, the Podocarps. Uh, and this grove, some members of this this grove, which only consists of about 50 trees, uh, are over uh, over 1,500 years old. Getting up there on a, you know, probably 2,000 years old. Some of the largest individuals of this species that are that are still left after extensive logging from about I don't know early 1800s up until the 1970s. And this this species, known as the Huon pine, Lagerostrobus franklinii, grows incredibly slowly. So to see trees of uh, the size that we're about to to take a gander at means, I mean, it just gives you an idea of how old these things must be. All right, let's go check it out. So speaking of Podocarpaceae, here's something known as the celery pine. All these these Europeans, they called, uh, you know, when they first got here, when a British first got here, they called everything a pine, even though there's no pines in the southern hemisphere. This is uh, Phyllocladus aspleniafolius. They called it celery top pine, all right, which is, uh, again, a member of uh, Podocarpaceae. Very old lineage of conifers, which is primarily uh, southern hemisphere and, uh, and tropical. You get a couple species in Mexico and a couple north of the equator. But uh, most of the diversity is down here in the southern hemisphere. Jesus Christ, this, you can tell how wet it is here. This is, this is a temperate rainforest. Temperature's about, I don't know, I'd say 55 degrees, maybe, maybe in the 60s, low 60s. But everything is incredibly wet. And the further west you go, we're at the eastern extent of this uh, tree's range here. The further west you go, the wetter it gets. You know, so that in the western part of the range, they get upwards of like, I think it was something like six feet of rain a year. And right here we got a member of the uh, olive family, the ash tree family, Oleaceae. This is Natalia ligastrina. See, almost opposite leaves, but not quite. Well, I guess they are there. They're kind of offset, seems to me. All right, large shrub, small tree, somewhat inconspicuous flowers. Growing here in the temperate rainforest at the base of this uh, Huon. There's that, there's that celery top pine again. So what do we mean when we say conifer? We, we mean naked seed, gymnosperm. Okay, flowering plants are angiosperms, conifers are gymnosperms. Gymnosperm means naked seed. When you look at the quote-unquote cones of uh, some of the plants like the Podocarpaceae, it's, just, it's literally just a, a seed encapsulated by a, a single leafy bract. I mean, it's a really quote-unquote primitive reproductive system for plants. But back in the Jurassic, this is what most plants were. Most plants were conifers, all right? There were no uh, angiosperms yet. There, you had seed ferns, you had ferns, uh, you had the conifers, 
etc. You know, people think of pines. Pines are actually a, pr a pretty recent arrival on the evolutionary scene. Right here is a uh, Eucryphia lucida, known as a uh, leatherwood, which is in a uh, Cunoniaceae. Big white flowers when these things go off, and you could look at those opposite leaves, white on the abaxial surface, bright white on the abaxial surface, and just alternating pairs of opposite leaves. This guy right here is a namesake genus of the island. All right, this is Tasmania lanceolata, which uh, doesn't get uh, doesn't get very large, but it's in Winteraceae, which is another one of them, one, another one of them basal angiosperm families. Oh, this one's cool, Anopterus glandulosus, Escaloniaceae, which is a family you also get in South America. Once again, you get that Gondwanan distribution, that relictual Gondwanan distribution from a time when South America, Antarctica, and Australia were all uh, connected via land bridge. You know, maybe 60, 50, 60 million years ago. See this guy right here, remember the blueberry family? The Apacrid subfamily with that very distinct new burst of uh, new vegetative growth. Cyathodes glauca. All right, the Apacrid subfamily can be a nightmare. There's so many species here. And a lot of them all look the same. They got that parallel leaf venation. They look more like a monocot than a blueberry. But they are in Ericaceae. You can see those anthers exerted from that uh, ursulate corolla. Five fused petals fused into a little urn with the anthers popping out. And then look, yeah, that, that venation is parallel. Forming a multi-branched uh, large shrub. And here we go, another plant in the understory here, Pimalea drupacea. From the Thymaleaceae, which I think we only get one or two members in North America, but Pimalea is a huge genus in Australia. Look at those tiny four-petaled flowers. Thymaleaceae is big in South Africa, too. It's another one of those families that's mostly Southern Hemisphere. Fuzzy stems, opposite leaves. And a little, uh, little sime of uh, a bunch of tiny four-petaled flowers. Oh, look at this, little hallway of uh, cutting grass. In the genus Gania, Gania grandis, look at that. You could see the ridges on those leaves. Known as cutting grass, because it will literally cut you. It's like a, like a, give you a giant paper cut. Serrated margins and, and ridges on those uh, very long wisp-like leaves. God. Meanest sedge in the world. Meanest sedge in the world. That might be meaner somewhere. All right, a, a, a sedge that'll make you bleed. Now, as we walk through this track, all right, I can hear a bubbling creek to my right, which is important to note because most of the range of these trees tends to be riparian. They tend to grow in water. Not always. It's, if, it's, if they're not growing in a creek, then the ground certainly has to be very, very wet, if not outright waterlogged. Right, these guys, Bowera rubioides, Cunoniaceae. The Cunonia family, very common plant Tasmania. Looks like it's getting a little hairy here. It's getting a little dense. Fuck. Oh yeah, they got they got terrestrial leeches here too. Sorry, guy, you gotta go. All right, you're cute, but uh, time to dip out. Oh, they don't do it. Get off me. Get off me. And then suddenly we reach a clearing, and we see some of the larger individuals of uh, Ligero strobos franklinii, the Huon pines. That's, it's gotta be an 80 to 90 foot tall tree. You can see, I mean, <laughs> they're growing right on the water. Look at the bubbly texture of that bark too, distinct for this species. There's an old one. Knowing how slow they grow, this has to be at least a thousand years old. Look at all the moss, all the all the, all the moss growing on it. Interesting about these two is they will root themselves into the ground. They will root if a tree falls over, branches of it will root into the ground. No root hormones needed. They're just that acclimated to such a wet habitat. Yeah, this is definitely a tree that cannot dry out. You know, in western Tasmania, west of here, is the ground is just wet enough. They get enough rainfall that they can grow. They're not they're not just growing in creeks. They can they can actually grow 
uh, on the terrestrial ground. Here's a kangaroo fern. Microsorum. I can't tell if that's a epicormic shoot coming out or if that's a seedling that germinated on another tree. These things have been here for easily a thousand years. Meaning the population was probably here well before that. Meaning this creek, as modest as it seems, has probably been here for thousands of years before that. Look at that. That's incredible. Anyway, with me right now, I got the curator of botany at the uh, Hobart uh, Herbarium, the Tasmania Herbarium, Miguel de Sala. Uh, so let's, uh, Miguel, you want to tell us what we're doing here, how old this, uh, this population is? Oh, I don't know exactly how old they are because none of these trees have been logged. Um, they're all standing as they were, and they were discovered maybe 50 years ago. I mean, as far as we know, they might have been discovered by the old-time loggers, but uh, they never logged them because it's too hard to get them out of where we are. It's a swampy flat, and there's no easy access. So they're probably... These, these individual trees might be a 1,000, maybe 2,000 years old. Just by comparing tree diameters with, with logged ones that we know of, we just visited a logged one a little bit earlier today. You can see the, a slice through the trunk, which is 2,000 years old, and it's a comparable diameter to this tree here. Right, I, I looked at it, it was about 30 centimeters or 30, uh, 30 years to a centimeter. Yeah, so just for comparison, these trees are a bit over a meter across. And so what's, what is, what's the ecology of these? I mean, they'll root from cuttings, trees will just clone themselves, and then how, how do seedlings get established? They, they come up very strongly from seedlings, so they reproduce very readily from seed, but the seed is not very long-lived in the soil seed bank. Uh, but they also, because of the environment that they live in, often in their flood plains and, and river flats and so on, if any pieces of the tree break off during a flood and then wash up in a, in a gravel bank or a sand bank, they'll often take root and become established. Or when trees fall over, they'll often root from the nodes and then sprout new upright branches. From so a branch, like a bra growing. like just like a choya, like if a branch falls off, washes downstream, it can root itself. That's right. And often we find... Um, some of these really old um, established trees growing on a distinct line, which suggests very much that, and they're all the same age, suggests that there was an older trunk that fell over and then re-sprouted along the length of the trunk, and that's why you end up with a line of all same age trees. So, and if those trees are two, two and a half thousand years old, just imagine how old the individual is, because they're often a clone. So the, the range of this, like, let's say you got here 1790, you're studying this plant, you know, the range of this has contracted uh, a whole lot since then. Well, what happened? Oh, uh, well, very, very quickly since Europeans first, Europeans first arrived in Tasmania, they realized uh, that this species, like Aristrobus franklinii, has a timber with really high essential oil content, which stops any insects from boring into it. And it was a fantastic, light, yet strong shipbuilding timber. So they started immediately logging it for shipbuilding uh, from pretty much 1804 onwards. Um, this thing didn't actually get a scientific name for another 40 years or so because it's so difficult to find the, the fertile parts, the uh, megastrobili particularly. And, um, and in that time, up until commercial logging ceased in the 1980s, almost all the decent stands of hue and pine in Tasmania with, with good straight trees like this were logged because the timber was so incredibly valuable. Um, so how, what's the history of this, this grove then? It's, it's been discovered maybe 40, 50 years ago and, um, and it's a, one of the few groves left in southeastern Tasmania of un, unlogged human pines. So it's never, uh, none of the trees exhibit any signs of cutting or logging. We're standing in a, in a pristine human pine rainforest, which is not a very common vegetation type over here. So, but aside from this population, I mean, if you want to see old growth lagrostrobos, you have to go deep into the cut, deep into the bush. Yes. You know, hours of trekking through remote wilderness to find them. And, and usually on the opposite end of the island to where we are, on the western side of the island. Here we're in the southeastern side of the island, where, where they're not all that common. Because the rainfall is not as high here, it's, but it's much higher in the west. What's the rainfall in the west? They're probably, the, there's two weather stations in a place called Lake Margaret and a place called Lake, uh, Mount Reed, and they are between 2,000 and 3,000 millimetres of rain a year, so six to nine feet of rain per year. Um, 
and it's, it's it rains almost every two out of every crazy. three days probably. So this is, I mean, it's like the br- climate of British Columbia. It is, and up on the on the upper slopes where you get the orographic effect of the of the mist rising and so on. So it's even wetter um, up on the on the slopes, and quite often we get groves of these things growing on on slightly elevated slopes. So all the precipitation comes from the west. Virtually all of our precipitation comes from the west. Yes. Oh yeah, look at this. There you go. There's some seedlings right there. They don't seem to be, I mean, unless there's a buried branch or something, but not that I can see. These seem to be actually seedlings. But again, who knows when they got established. Maybe they got established, you know, 40 years ago and it's just been re-sprouting and then competing with the the taller growing trees right here. So that's the, that's the foliage. You can see it just kind of looks like a juniper, but no relation to juniper. Entirely different family, you know, 200 million years removed from junipers. Just a series of, uh, well, those don't look like decussate scales. They look like they're spiraling. I might be wrong. I don't know. Spiraling or decussate? Look at, look at how wet the ground is. God, it's just a moss bed. God, such a cool habitat. Just the extremely wet temperate rainforest. Half times the diameter of the country so induced. Yeah, that's bigger than the one we were just looking at. That was 2,000 years old. The slice. They all, I mean, do they frequently have, you know, multiple shoots like that, multiple trunks or what? Yeah, pretty often. I mean, they're most sought after trees for by the loggers where they're straight trunk trees. So we might get a, we might get a skewed picture today because a lot of the straight trees were taken out logged and taken out of the populations and now we're looking at what they left behind which was often what they didn't consider to be high quality timber right we saw we saw a tree on the Pyman river that was curved i mean it wasn't straight at all and it was large so we figured they just yeah, had been left they probably said not worth it not worth the effort to cut it down okay so this 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 is lagero strobos too that we're standing on huh yeah that's a fallen lagero strobos you can see by the bark texture you can see that little bubbly knobbly Nobly bark that's still attached to it. So this tree's probably a fairly recent fall. Right, they got that pimply bark. Very distinct bark texture on these. Yeah, you can get a bit of it on philoplatus as well, but I think it's pretty typical of Lagarostrobus. And, and when you see them in a rainforest, when you might not get a clear picture of what the leaves look like because they're way up there, it's a good indicator. And so these just, I mean, these trees just don't rot. They don't. They can stay on the ground for hundreds or thousands of years. Uh, dendrochronologists who study uh, tree rings and study past climates through tree rings and so on find them really useful because especially in the swampy ground they like to grow on they'll fall over and they don't rot and you can have trees that have been in the ground for thousands of years with beautiful tree rings to cut that haven't rotted away and there we got some mega stroboli i mean you could see the cones well, i don't even know if you'll be able to see them in the video they're they're literally you know maybe half an inch long that little zigzag thing oh yeah there we go there's one you can see it just a little zigzag, a little zigzag female cone. Look at it. You can see down there where a branch has just been submerged for God knows how long, and it has rooted. It's actually rooted itself into the creek bed. God, that's the that's the biggest one I've seen. We've been all over the island. And that's the largest one we've seen left. And that thing's got to be easily two thousand years old. You can't really tell from here, but that's that's about four feet across diameter breast height with a nice nothophagus cunning hammy eye in front of it one of the uh, southern beaches you think these were growing on antarctica back in the day surely or at least uh, their most recent ancestor was okay this is hilarious look there you go there's the uh, there's the female cone those are, that's the mega strobilis that's how this thing reproduces there's maybe, that's a small one. I've seen them maybe twice that long. Looks like it's got maybe two or three seeds in it, if that. So the seeds are the size of a, a, a little silica bead, you know, that you'd maybe use to, uh, you know, preserve some DNA, preserve some plant tissue for, uh, you know, DNA extraction. Or the size of uh, maybe a grain of rice, less than that. Probably less than a grain of rice. Extremely tiny, so it's it's got to create it's got to take some active disturbance for these to get established, you know. Maybe post flood, if there's like a sandy bank left over for them to uh, grow in. Maybe a little moss bed. Maybe they get established in a moss bed. The ones back there seem to be doing fine. A little moss bed. 
but you could see how small that seed would be. But the seedlings are extremely shade tolerant. I mean, they have to be. Look how, look how dark it is in this forest. Jesus, this is hilarious too. Look at this. So this branch came up at some point, was knocked down perhaps 500 years ago by another tree falling, another limb falling maybe. Came down, rerooted itself into the ground down here, then continued growing, and then goes on for another 40 feet that way. And the whole branch is just covered in uh, microsorum and moss. Yeah, that looks like an actual... Well, no, there's roots in that. That's a seedling that germinated on the tree. There's a big root right there. So this this is a this is a different individual that germinated on the branch of the parent. Massive ancient bastards. Beautiful, massive ancient bastards. It is that massive one again. It's starting to rain a little bit. It's hard, especially when I got this camera in wide angle, to really get a grasp of how large that thing is. But easily 2,000 years. You can see that creek's not even that deep either. It's like two, two feet maybe, max. It's just been here for thousands of years. There you go, there's a fallen tree right there. Who knows how old this thing is? It's about six and a half feet tall. But it could just be a rooted branch, so. Nice blechnum. So wet. Look at how wet this forest is. It's for someone who's normally botanizing in deserts. This is blowing my mind. Remnants of Gondwana. How long ago did Antarctica have temperate rainforests on it, huh? That's what I want to know. Well, there's a nice straight one. Loggers would have loved to take that. Thank God they weren't able to get in here. Oh, look at that. Trimophila cyanocarpa, Alstromariaceae. Order Liliales. Another family with the southern hemisphere distribution. South America. You got uh, relatives of this in South America. Bomaria and Alstromaria. Look at that. Big blue fruits when it's uh, after those flowers are pollinated and mature. Look at this massive guy. Look at this. At the base of the, the oldest one in the group here. The one that's about, I don't know, four and a half feet diameter breast height. Just covered in lichens, too. Look at these fucking lichens, man. Look at those. Just, <laughs> I can just tell they're so, it's so moist where they grow. So leafy. Moss on everything. When this tree germinated, the ground level was probably a little bit lower, too. I mean, you can see it's kind of built its own, that root system has, has built its own little mound right here. Look at that burl, too. Jesus. So incredible. What a beast. I can't imagine seeing one of these and just wanting to cut it down. You know, that's what kind of blows my mind about all those loggers. They should take a few, but all of them? Christ. No moss. It's like a little ladder of moss up there. Okay, so what, what's going on here? This is this is pretty rare itself right here, huh? That's right. So we're standing in a small patch of straight human pine rainforest. And so while human pines aren't rare, there's there's small human pines left over all around the island. Straight bits of rainforest dominated by human pines like this 
have become pretty rare because almost all of them were targeted for logging. So what's left, you know, where there is some left is mostly, and where the loggers couldn't get to, is mostly stuff that didn't have a straight trunk that was curved. Yes, either places that had bad quality timber or places where getting the timber out of there was too much hassle. So, so many epiphytes on these and not on the eucalypts, and that's because the eucalypts shed their bark pretty easily, huh? Yes, um, because every year the eucalypts will shed their outermost layer of their bark. There's one right there, Eucalyptus obliqua. Temperate rainforest eukes. Okay, so towering above the lagro strobus, we got that eucalypt, Eucalyptus obliqua. The lagro strobus don't get very tall. They just live forever and they, get, they can get kind of wide. You can see that there's about six of them right there. Each of them probably upwards of 900 years old. Just sustained by this single little creek. Chewon pines are able to grow on waterlogged land. And so they are able to send air down to roots, which is so it might be, um, there might be little intercells that... Um, so gas exchange. Yeah, gas exchange perhaps. It's such a distinct, almost, wall of my pines, which also aren't a pine, also get kind of that bubbly, that yeah. bubbly texture too, huh? I, yeah, I haven't seen the wall of my pines in place, uh, unfortunately. That'd be something to see. Unrelated family, but maybe it's a similar mechanism. But it's so distinct. And you've been you've been places where you've still where you've seen, I mean, huge huge groves of these still growing just on on land, like yes. no creek around. Yeah. So here we're standing in a grove that's maybe half an acre, a quarter of an acre in size, but uh, there's still a few groves of hue and pine rainforest like this that are many many acres in size. Uh, like there was one there's one in a place called Badger Creek in the southwest, um, which is. It's very difficult to get into because it's very dense rainforest, but that's probably the size of 10 or 20 football fields of, of just straight hue and pine rainforest. They're the dominant tree there. They're the dominant tree, and they're larger than these ones. Jesus. But that's, I mean, incredibly remote. How do you get out there? Oh, a helicopter. Or, or walk for a few days. But, <laughs> and that's why they're still there. Pull it's, a Denny King, huh? It's very remote. It's very hard to get in, and it would have been very hard to get the timber out. What is, what's the feather you got right there? What's that? Oh, that's a lyrebird feather. Lyrebirds are a feral pest in Tasmania. They're native to mainland Australia, and they were introduced here for show purposes. And uh, they scratch the hell out of the forest floor. They actually do cause a fair bit of damage. They, so they can actually, they can, they yeah, can be kind of a... We don't have any sort of scratchy, grand-dwelling birds. Um, and so they're like a turkey. And so they, just, they, they could be kind of a drag. Yeah, they are. They're a bit yeah. of a drag, but they're an amazing mimic. They sound like <laughs> everything you can think of. They'll so... What do you think is going to be the long-term prognosis for this grove of trees? Oh, it's a really healthy grove. There's, there's a mixed, mixed stand of trees of different ages. There's good recruitment of seedlings. Uh, it's, it's a really nice, healthy piece of forest. So as long as the fire stays out of it, and as long as, you, you, as long as we're able to maintain the water availability, that we don't get drought as a result of climate change or anything like that, it's probably not too bad. And it's protected. I mean, it's illegal to cut living huons It's in now. a reserve, yes. And, and this this specific bit is in a reserve as well. But I mean, even in, in areas where it's not in a reserve anymore, is it still legal to cut no, living human? We don't. Human? We don't. I don't think we log commercially any human plants anymore. It's it's looked down upon. Yeah, I'm not sure what the rules are if you had some in private property or anything like that, but I don't think there's any native forest human pine logging that goes on. So no wood chips for human pine, just for the eucalyptus. <laughs> oh, it hurts just to think about that. <laughs> going to make paper, going to make toilet paper and. Where does most of the eucalyptus they log go to? Uh, a lot of it gets exported as whole saw logs to China these days. Um, I mean, a lot of it goes for saw log here in, in sawmills. I, I don't think we export a lot of wood chips anymore because there's only one or two mills left running. Um, but it's not really... They don't use it for building material. They just... Oh, no, they do. They do. A good, straight, non, non-sort of rotten core logs do get used for building. And veneer. Um... There's a there's a veneer mill not too far off from here as well. Mm, but they but a lot of it goes to chips too. A huh? lot of it goes to chips or it exports it as whole saw logs um, off to other countries. At least if we chip them up, we add some value to them. But exporting the whole logs is a little sad. Miguel was just Miguel was just commenting how low the diversity is, relatively speaking, 
in these forests, okay, in terms of, you know, general biodiversity. When you look down at the ground, the diversity of cryptogams, little mosses and whatnot, little mosses, other bryophytes, uh, is, is through the roof. How many species do you think of uh, mosses and even lichens are here? Uh, I couldn't even start to guess. I'm the wrong person to ask. I work only on vascular plants, but... Um but certainly there's that funny paradox in the, in the wettest forests where your dominant canopy is made up of only three or four vascular plant species and yet you've got epiphytic lichens growing on them, you've got lichens on the rocks and mosses and mosses and liverworts growing all the trees and rocks and on the ground. Yeah, and also, Miguel, I noticed looking at the ground here, it's not flat. You've got these, these lumps and mounds everywhere. What do you think that's from? Just generations of logs and other trees dying and falling yeah. over or what? Yeah, there's, we can see actually quite a few trees on the ground around us, so it's probably the same thing's been going on over thousands of years. We're on a we're on a little flat here where the grade of the creek goes from steep and rushing to completely flat. So this would have been a, a sediment trap. The the river we're probably on the flat plain of the river, and all the stuff that falls over over the years forms a three dimensional structure. Holy shit! Look at all the look at all the buds. Look at all the epicormic buds popping yeah. off of this one. And any of these will, will just root in water, yes. huh? I mean, not, not even, no hormone needed. No, nothing. This is apparently some stress response, huh? Because I noticed the top is missing up there. My idea is it's probably been hit by the falling top of that eucalypt over there. Ah, uh, yeah, that makes sense. Oh yeah, when that eucalypt fell, it took the top off that. Look at that, the tree, the tree that's behind this one that's damaged, you can see it sent out a branch and then just whoosh, sent out another shoot straight up. So do you think all these, these are all the same individual or is it hard to say or what? Yeah, I think these are all the same individual, um, either from a tree that fell down and it's ranting from the base or from uh, where the log landed and they all sprouted from the, from the, Epicormic buds on the sides. Yeah, look look at this one right here. That guy right there, there's a log. Looks like it fell off and it sprouted up again and it's continuing to grow vertically. So fell off, God knows when, rooted itself and rerooted itself into the ground and then just continued growing like nothing had happened but with five or six different uh, apical meristems. Yeah, so there's a, lot, there's a whole lot of timber you can see actually uh, drained under the creek. And this creek's probably moved course over the centuries or millennia. And I, I always wonder how old, whether those are roots or old fallen trunks that fell in the swamp and are still there thousands of years ago. It's just 1,000 or 2,000 year old Huon wood. I can't get over how, <laughs> how not flat the ground is, how lumpy. Like a little elfin forest. Oh, look at that. Yeah, it's making a little cut through. Yep. Jesus. Yeah, it's trunk. And, and these trunks at the base here might, might also be re-sprouted off that. I don't know because they're slightly different ages or slightly different thicknesses. Oh, yeah. Jesus. It does look like it. It looks like they're just sprouts off this trunk that fell God knows how many hundreds of years ago. And then just form new trees. Yeah, sure. So we've got two, at least two species of filmy ferns on this trunk. Hymenophyllum australi with uh, smooth-sided leaves. I don't know if you can see them. And Hymenophyllum cupressiforme, which has um, serrated fronds, not leaves. So filmy ferns, and they can only grow in basically places that are wet all the time. Yeah, extremely mesic environments because Hymenophyllum has a frond that's only two cells thick. So they lose moisture very, very easily. So this is probably one of the thinnest ferns in terms of... Oh yeah. Leaves. Yeah. Ah, Atherospermamoshatum, what they call sassafras down here. It's in its own family, Atherospermataceae, but it, uh, it is in the uh, sassafras order, Laurelis, so. And it's got a, kind of a nice smell to it too. It actually has saffron in those leaves too. See more, more massive bastards across this creek. Oh, 
Okay, so this is kind of weird because this is a member of a family that we don't normally associate with uh, very wet places. At least I don't. You know, I think of Proteaceae, I think of like South Africa. But here we are in a temperate rainforest. What's this? What are we looking at here? We're looking at Orites uh, diversifolia. So Orites is a genus that's present in Australia and South America. And I'm not sure if New Zealand as well. Uh, but it tends to hang out either alpine areas, very cold and wet alpine areas or rainforests in here. So you, you get this genus in South America too, another yes. another relic of a time when Antarctica linked South America and Australia. I mean, it, it is a peaceful place, you know? It's got a very nice ambiance to it. Dark, calm, easy to forget a lot of the dark bullshit going on in the world when you're here. Miguel, thank you so much, appreciate it. No All right, thanks brother. Anyway, well, there you, there you got it. Lagrostrobos franklinii, a.k.a. the Huon pine. Total misnomer, no relation to pines. Very ancient trees, extremely long-lived, extremely rot-resistant, extremely drought-intolerant. Relics of a time when Antarctica was forested, you know, before those circumpolar currents opened up, cut the continent off from the heat transport system of the warmer ocean currents further to the north. Before... Plate tectonics move the continents further apart. Can you imagine what it must have been like before it became what it is now, which is just a giant ice cube? Actually, you got, I think you got three species of plants on the Antarctic continent. Maybe, maybe a few more mosses. Anyway, that's all I got for you today. Have a good rest of your afternoon. Go fuck yourself. Bye. Oh, don't don't get rid of it. He's just trying to survive. Come on. That's not nice. He's just trying to get by in this world. I feel your pain, buddy. I feel your pain. Look, come here. Come here. Look, I, I'll, I'll feed you. I'll feed you. Come here. Come here. You can see over there you've got uh, a lot of eucalypts, but they're only growing on the ridge line. And down here in the valley below us, it's only the rainforest tree species, not the phagus, atherosperma, um, and so on. And that's because um, because the fire tends to travel along the ridge lines, and this rainforest um, needs to have been growing without a fire for at least 500 years, because that's about the lifespan of a eucalypt. And eucalypts only regenerate after a fire. So this area never burns, but that that area does. The, the ridge, ridge does. The drier ridge line does. Yes. Because it's crazy, you wouldn't normally associate fire with a temperate rainforest, but it, I mean, it, the rainforest is so close to habitat that it actually does burn. That's right, there's, there's just a clear boundary right there. That burns, this one doesn't. And, um, and the rainforest species are also not very flammable, whereas eucalypts are extremely flammable trees. And the fire finds it difficult to travel from one to the other. It has to be a very, very hot, strong fire to travel into a rainforest. Look at this member of the Restionaceae, which, you know, is so so diverse in South Africa. Okay, order Poeles, order of grasses. They're very beautiful and very large, some of them upwards of 15 feet tall in South Africa. But here, you can see, it just looks like silly string. It's just the Tasmanian Restios. It's another one of those Gondwanan families. Calorophus is the genus here. Calorophus elongatus. Plants are male or female. Individuals are male or female, so they're dioecious. You see, there's a, there's a female. Nice pink stigmas. Tilopia truncata.